Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all. Thanks for joining today's webinar on Alan Heath uh, Network Protocols. Uh, so this week and next week, we are talking about everything I owe. Um, on Thursday this week, my colleague Keith will be talking about everything I owe uh, with SQ and Q. And next week on Thursday, uh, my colleague Jack will be talking about everything I owe with Avantis and DLive. Uh, those will both be on Facebook Live um, at 3 p.m. UK time. So make sure you check in uh, on Facebook and join them for those sessions as well. Um, I'm just waiting a couple more seconds while everyone joins uh, the session. So again, thanks for joining. I do sincerely hope everyone is well and safe wherever you may be. Uh, we are very much looking forward to uh, being out uh, and about in person as soon as possible. In the meantime, we're, we're really happy for you to join us online. Uh, and, it's, and it's a great pleasure for us to continue sharing knowledge with you as much as we can uh, on these uh, online platforms. So let's uh, get going with, with today's topic, which is uh, essentially everything I owe, but we really want to go in a little bit of technical detail around our own proprietary uh, digital audio protocols. So um, I'm, I'm sure you'll be aware, and I'll just bring up my, my uh, slides, there we go. Um, I'm, I'm sure you'll be aware of the everything IO concept of Alan Heath, which is that um, almost all of our expanders and, uh, and stage boxes are pretty much compatible with all of our mixing consoles in certain different ways. Now, uh, there's a, a vast variety and a wide range of uh, everything IO boxes. Um, and if you want to know more about which boxes are specifically compatible with which mixing consoles, uh, the best thing to do is to go onto the Alan Heath website, uh, click on the everything IO uh, page, and you will be able to select a mixer and it will show you all of the boxes that are compatible with that given mixer. Now, before I start uh, talking about too many technical things. Um, I just wanted to add, there is a Q&A section for this. So at the end, I'll have plenty of time to take any of your questions, but don't hesitate to pop any questions into the Q&A box, even during the session. And if I can, I'll answer them during, during the webinar. Uh, and otherwise I'll get back to them towards the end of the session if I can. So um, digital audio, I, I think um, a few years back when we did training, um, there was still a lot of room for um, selling the features or the benefits of digital audio over network uh, to users who were still very used to using analog. Um, and I think nowadays, pretty much everyone is on board. Most people are, are uh, at least aware, but most people are even knowledgeable on lots of different network protocols. And we'll touch on some of those in a second, but I don't think now we really need to sell any more the benefits of using network technology for digital audio. So, you know, things like ease of deployment, the, the, the ease of uh, scalability. So, you know, if you used to have a 30 channel multi-core, if you wanted to grow to bigger, you needed to buy a 72 channel multi-core. And whereas now it's an extra network cable and you can grow your system quite simply. Um, obviously, speaking of multi-cores, you know, digital audio offers a, a higher channel count in a reduced cable size, so um, no more dragging huge multi-cores around to get high channel counts, although we are coming back to more and more uh, uh, network cable multi-cores, which are coming kind of full circle around to large, large scale multi-cores. Um, Things, simple things like cable availability. So if you're in a show somewhere and, and your multi-core, your analog multi-core fails uh, on a Saturday night at 10 p.m., you'll have a hard time finding another multi-core cable. Whereas getting a network cable, you could even get one from your local IT shop or 24 hour supermarket usually stop them. So, so, you know, just those little things. Distribution, being able to put audio wherever you want quite easily. Obviously, uh, interference, so digital audio over, uh, over network is less um, sensitive to uh, interference, whether that's electronic or, or other. Um, quality of audio over distance, obviously, with analog, if you run cable over long distance, the audio quality does degrade to some extent. Uh, 
uh, over long distance. So that's other things that are maintained using digital audio. Um, so many of these topics, and I'm sure everyone's kind of uh, now really comfortable with why digital audio is, is a benefit, even if it comes with a bit of a, a learning curve. Now, speaking of learning curve, um, all of the things we're going to talk about today are related to our um, proprietary protocols, and we'll look at those in just a second. If you want to know more about our protocols, obviously go on our website. And if you go onto our knowledge uh, base on the support section, uh, there's a couple of white papers of how you can deploy our protocols with VLANs if you want to convert to fiber and things like that. So slightly more advanced things. If you want to know more, there are lots of resources on our website. So make sure uh, you check those out when you can. Okay, so as I mentioned today, we're talking about the Allen Heath proprietary network protocols. And those protocols are uh, five, there's five of them. Uh, they are ACE, DSnake, Giga Ace, DX and GX, which GX kind of goes with Giga Ace and we'll, we'll talk about that. So those are our protocols, the ones that we wrote, we designed, and, um, and we'll see why in just a second. Now, you can use other third-party protocols, uh, protocols that you know very well, like Dante, uh, Maddy, Waves, SoundGrid, EtherSound, are all various different digital protocols um, that can be deployed with Allen Heath consoles. We do have cards that allow you to communicate over those protocols. Um, but those are not the topic of today. We're talking about specifically R ones. Now, one thing to be aware of, however, is that today we're going to see that all of our protocols have um, fixed values that we're aware of, like in, in terms of latency and that sort of thing. Um, with third party protocols, it's, it's uh, wise to keep an eye out because they can often have their own specificities in terms of uh, patching and how you can route audio and also various or variable latencies. So different protocols or even different parts of specific protocols can have different latencies um, and those latencies can be set up and changed as well. The best thing I can advise you, I mean, probably the most common one used in terms of networkable audio is Dante. Um, if you want to know more about Dante, jump onto the Ordinate website and uh, check out their uh, level one, two, and three certification. If you haven't done that already, uh, definitely useful. But that's not the topic of today. So today we are talking about our uh, pr proprietary uh, protocols, the, the five that I mentioned before. Um, and these are all point-to-point -point protocols. So they're all designed to be connected from one socket, one connector to another socket or to another connector with a single cable or a single cable with a redundant backup. And um, because of the way this has been designed, and we'll look at why we did that, um, because there's no switches, because we're not taking one cable and um, sending it into a network switch, devices cannot be distributed in the same way that others can, um, like star topologies or ring topologies. Um, and so we're, we're always aware of the, the the signal flow, if you will, from one unit to another. We always know that's what the value of that is because it's fixed. We're not sending it to lots of different places um, at any given time. And so because we're not distributing audio in this fashion to from one device to, to multiple devices in that way through a, a network switch um, that you would with other protocols, it means that there's no network level patching that needs to be done. Now, what I mean by network level patching, and, and those who are familiar with uh, protocols such as Dante uh, will understand this, is that you don't need to connect with a computer or with, with uh, your device and patch audio feeds from one network device to another network device. So let me explain. In this example, for example, I've uh, patched aux one to my DX port, that's my S-Link card, so to a DX port one. And so no matter what stage box I connect to my DX port one, my aux one will always appear on output one of that hardware box, okay? So I don't need to say, uh, so I send aux one of my mixer to the S-Link, I connect something into my S-Link, which is a stage box, and AUX1 will automatically appear on the 
first output of that stage box. I do not need to go into uh, any other patching and say, okay, so I want my mixer DX output to go to that stage box input one on the DX, and then it'll come out of the output of that stage box. So there's no network level patching to be done. If you're familiar with Dante, you'll be familiar with Dante controller, for example, where you need to patch each device in the network to another device in the network and you can cross patch channels. So that doesn't need to be done, which makes it really um, practical and easy and straightforward to deploy. Uh, in the same way, if we took inputs uh, as an example, if I have uh, a stage box uh, such as a DX stage box connected to my S-Link port and I patch the S-Link port one to my first channel, that input one will always appear on my first channel and I can't cross patch it on a network level. So that's fixed. Um, that makes for some really practical applications um, and really, uh, it, it makes it really easy to deploy. Um, say for example, you have a drum riser with one of our DX boxes um, on board and that's connected to my mixer. Um, I can unplug that stage box, roll the drums off, roll another drum riser on with another stage box, connect it to my mixer and all of those channels will appear back on the same channels on the mixer. So I don't need to then identify that box and say I want inputs one to 16 of that box to arrive on input one to 16 of my DX port to my mixer and then inputs one to 16 of that DX port go to channels one to 16 of my mixer. So you don't need to do that. You can just swap two boxes out and the inputs will appear in the same place. So that's really useful for things like drum risers, for example. It's also really useful if for any reason you need to change a box out um, for, for whatever reason, if there's a, a technical issue and you need to replace a box, you take a box away, you put a new box in and you connect it. All the inputs will appear at the same place. There's no uh, routing that needs to be reestablished. So really nice and, and easy to deploy and flexible. Okay. So really quickly before we go into those protocols, uh, again, one thing I wanted to touch on is cable specification. Now you'll find uh, cable specification in all of our documentation anyway, but I did want to record it today. So we recommend shielded twisted pair uh, Cat5e or above cables. Um, and for all of our protocols, we recommend up to 100 meters. Now, for some of our protocols, we did recommend a little bit higher. However, we realized that due to various qualities of cable and various specifications of cable not quite being up to the standard that we expected, uh, we found a lot of people had issues uh, really when they were pushing into those longer lengths. So we, we thought it safer and, and, um, and, and yeah, more secure um, for 100 meters, up to 100 meters to be a safe value for everything. Um, and again, shielded twisted pair, um, mainly for emissions and and these are these emission values um, or requirements vary country per country but um, but for us it's shielded twisted pair across the board cool right so let's have a look at some of our protocols today so i'm going to go over some tech specs really briefly and and they don't have a huge impact for you as an engineer on a day-to-day -day basis but it does help you to understand the differences between the different protocols and, and why we have different protocols uh, different protocols. The first one I want to talk about is ACE. Uh, ACE was our first proprietary protocol that we developed in 2009. And for us, uh, it seemed fairly obvious to develop our own protocol. Um, first of all, because it means we know and fully control the technical specifications of that protocol. So we can design it to do what we want to do. Uh, we can optimize it for our application specifically, where if we were to use somebody else's third party protocol, um, it might not be fully optimized for what we want to do. It might do lots of different things, but if those different things uh, are of no use to us, then, then you know, it's, it's extra performance for something that doesn't benefit us. So for us, it really made sense to develop our own protocol, uh, which is fully optimized for our use. Uh, on a development side, obviously, it also means that we have 100% of influence of what goes into that protocol moving forwards. Using third party protocols does open some benefits, but it also means that when we want to add features or improve performance, 
we sat, sit in the list of all the other manufacturers who also want to have their own uh, feature uh, enhancements and, and updates, et cetera. So it really means that we fully control that protocol and we can do uh, what we want with it. And as I mentioned, because it's fully optimized for our application, we can optimize it for low latency and, uh, and do exactly what we wanted to do. So ACE was the first protocol that we developed, which stands for audio and control over ethernet because we're sending audio and we're also sending control data over ethernet. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so as I mentioned before, ACE is a point to point protocol. So it means we don't run it through switches, network switches. We don't distribute it with network switches. It's a protocol that allows us to uh, transmit 64 by 64 channels at 48 kilohertz. Uh, it runs on hundred megabit uh, speed and it allows, as the name says, control over ethernet to tunnel ethernet through that protocol for TCP IP information for remote control, uh, also MIDI data. And we can also integrate third party remote control data as well. So we can distribute network information and remote control data uh, through the ACE protocol. Ultra low latency is 105 microseconds. So which is five samples, which is relative to any other protocol is virtually nothing. Uh, and as I mentioned, we can run up to 100 meters. So where do we find ACE? We find ACE uh, originally on our iLove consoles. And ACE was the protocol uh, that was used to connect our control surface to our mix racks. And much like DLive, some of you are familiar, um, iLive had the same concept of mix racks and uh, control surfaces as well. So ACE was the, the protocol that was designed for iLive uh, to allow audio and control data to be distributed uh, across the devices. We also introduced an ACE card for GLD um, and that allowed GLD to also integrate with, with iLive as well and be used as a digital split system uh, for mixing monitors, for example, with a GLD uh, on the side of an iLive if you wanted to. So that was also an option too. So further from that, we uh, moved on and we developed uh, DSnake, which, was, uh, which is a protocol used for expansion boxes specifically. So DSnake has no TCP uh, remote control data integrated into it. It only has remote control data integrated to control things like preamps, phantom powers, and pads in expansion boxes or stage boxes, if you like. So DSnake is specifically for expansion boxes. Again, it's a point-to-point -point protocol, so we don't distribute it through network switches. And DSnake is a bit special because it allows 40 by 20 channels at 48 kilohertz, but it also has uh, 40 channels of send reserved for the ME personal monitor system, monitoring system as well. So 40 inputs, 20 outputs, plus 40 for the ME personal monitoring system. Again, ultra low latency, 83 microseconds, so virtually nothing. It, it doesn't really add anything significant to the in to out latency of the mixing systems. And it benefits from auto matching firmware. So we'll touch on auto matching firmware in a moment as well, because it really is um, something quite powerful and quite useful for, uh, for using expanders with our mixers. So where do we find DSnake? First of all, we'll find DSnake on three different stage boxes, which are the AR84 eight input, four outputs um, rack unit, the AR2412, which is a 24 in 12 output unit, and the AB16. Um, now the AR2412 and AB16 have some specificities and we'll look at that in a second as well. Um, where do you find DSnake on mixers? Well, we'll find DSnake um, on Q, so on the back of Q, you'll find a DSnake port where you can connect any of those stage boxes we mentioned. And you'll also be able to use DSnake with SQ, Avantis, and AHM um, using the S-Link port on the back. And again, uh, towards the end, we'll look specifically at the S-Link ports uh, and what we can do with that. Okay, so one thing I wanted to mention is on the AR2412 and AB168 units, uh, there is a port named Expander. And this Expander port allows us to 
either daisy chain multiple units together. So we can day snake, uh, day snake, daisy chain, for example, an AR2412 with an AB168, um, AR2412 with an AR84, a 68 and a 68, uh, or a 68 and an AR84 together for multiple stage boxes. Um, we can also connect our ME personal monitoring system to the uh, AR2412 or AB168 units. Remember, we mentioned earlier on that there is 40 channels of send uh, reserved just for the ME system. Um, and so that's where you can connect the, the ME system to. Again, auto matching firmware, I, I add that because we will talk it about that in a little bit of detail in a moment. So moving on to GigaRace. Now, with the advance of Allen Heath mixers into 96 kilohertz with, with the arrival of um, the XCVI core, um, it became obvious that IO and digital audio transport needed to move to 96 kilohertz as well. Um, DLive and the power and the number of channels that there were also meant that we needed to be able to transport a higher uh, number of channels that was possible previously with uh, ACE and uh, DSnake. So we developed the ACE protocol further into GigaRace. GigaRace is uh, the same concept as ACE in the sense that um, it's again a point to point protocol. Uh, instead of using 100 megabit per second, it uses one gigabit per second, but it also allows us to uh, tunnel TCP IP and MIDI data and also third party remote control as well. It's a low latency protocol um, and it does support redundant connections. So that means that we can have a primary cable and secondary cable and should uh, the primary cable fail for any reason, the secondary will take over and, and vice, versa, vice versa. Okay. I do see a couple of questions coming in and I will come back to those uh, in, in just a second. So where do we find GigaRace? Now, as I mentioned, uh, GigaRace was uh, originally developed for the DLive platform. So we find it on DLive. Now, on DLive, there's a small speciality with GigaRace where there are built in GigaRace ports uh, on the mix rack and on the surface. Of course, if you want to know more, uh, please keep an eye out for upcoming DLive um, uh, sessions that we'll have coming in, in the near future. Um, but the connection that happens between uh, the DLive surface and the mix rack is done over GigaRace, um, but it allows 300 by 300 channels of audio at 96 kilohertz, as well as that control data we, we mentioned and the ethernet tunneling as well. The reason for that is, although uh, DLive is 128 channels uh, mixing system, we have three card slots in a mix rack um, and two card slots in the surface. And we need to be able to send any of these card slots to any of these card slots. So that's uh, three times 128 channels of audio that we need to be able to send from the mix rack to the surface. So the GigaRace in this perspective is slightly enhanced to allow that high channel count. So GigaRace can also be used with DLive with a GigaRace card in the mix rack. So this is a, a GigaRace card here in the mix rack. And in this case, we can use the DX hub that I'll show you in just a second to send the GigaRace connection into the hub and distribute into four DX ports. Now DX is the uh, expander protocol uh, for DLive and other mixers as well. We'll look at that in just a second. But I can take, as I mentioned, 128 channels of audio over GigaRace into a DX hub and distribute that into four times 32 by 32 channels, okay? And if I want to, I can add a second hub with a second cable and have a redundant backup with a second DX hub if I want to as well, okay? Where else do we find GigaRace? We can also find GigaRace um, to add an extra surface to my mix rack to uh, deploy multi-surface setups with multiple DLive surfaces controlling the mix rack. Um, multi-surface webinar coming up soon and keep your eye out for that because it is uh, a, a quite a specific application of DLive. But this allows us to distribute 128 channels of audio to uh, a second surface in the DLive system as well. Now we can also use GigaRace 
to create a digital split. So I can send 128 channels of audio from my DLive system into a second mixer such as an Avantis. And I can mix up to 64 channels on an Avantis or 48 on an SQ. And this is exactly like creating a, a, a digital split. So I'm taking the inputs from my DLive system uh, and sending them over GigaRace directly to another mixer so I can mix front of house with my DLive and monitors with my uh, Avantis, for example. Okay, and we can also use G, uh, GigaRace in GX mode. And GX is the expander protocol for GigaRace uh, where we can connect our GX 4816 uh, stage rack. Now we are sending 128 channels of audio each way, even if the GX 4816 is only a 48 by 16 box. And the reason for this is that the GX4816 has two DX ports on the front panel. And each of these DX ports, as we'll see in just a second, is 32 by 32 channels. So we're using the 48 here and an extra 64 for the DX ports themselves. Okay, cool. So where do we find GigaRace and GX? We'll find GigaRace and GX, uh, obviously, as we mentioned on DLive, but also on Avantis and SQ and AHM, using the S-Link ports. So I'm just gonna um, answer one of the questions that we uh, had come in from Chris to you know if we offer a virtual sound card type of driver on PC. Um, and that question does come up quite often, but unfortunately, because they are layer two, those protocols are not compatible um, to use over a standard ethernet connection on a computer. So uh, it's not something that would be immediately available. Obviously using third party protocols uh, such as Dante or Waves, you can uh, use virtual sound cards to uh, record or playback multitrack if you wanted to. Right, so one more protocol and then we're almost uh, towards the end and then I'll happily take your questions. So DX is the 96 kilohertz uh, Allen Heath protocol for extension boxes. Again, I won't go on too much about this. It's point to point. So we don't distribute this through a network switch. And DX allows not, uh, 32 by 32 channels at 96 kilohertz. Uh, it's 100 megabit per second uh, network. And again, it runs at ultra low latency uh, with uh, auto matching firmware as well. We can also do daisy chaining with DX in the same way that we could with, uh, with uh, DSnake uh, within the realm of 32 by 32 channels on a DX port. So which boxes carry DX? So you'll find DX on 16.4W, which is 16 in four output wall mount box, DX16.8, DX32 and DX012. So again, um, staying within the realm of 32 by 32 channels, that means I can daisy chain two 16.4Ws, for example, because that's 32 ins and eight outs, or I can daisy chain two DX16.8s, so that's 32 in, 16 out. So I need to stay under 32 channels, or I could do a 16.8 and a 16.4 if I want to. DX32, which is a 32 channel in or out in any combination. So it can be only 32 in or only 32 out. Um, and I cannot daisy chain a DX32 to anything at all. Um, but it could also be only outputs. It could be 16 in, 16 out, or any variation of the above. And then the DX012, which is uh, uh, 12 analog outputs or AES outputs as well. And I could daisy chain that with a 16A or a 16.4W if I want. Okay. So which mixing consoles use DX protocol? Uh, you'll find DX, as we mentioned, on DLive. So on DLive, you'll have two DX ports on the mix rack and a DX port on the surface. SQ with the S-Link card or the optional S-Link uh, option card. Avantis, again, using uh, the S-Link port on the rear, but you can also use the DX uh, expander card uh, in the back of Avantis to give you four extra DX ports. And as I mentioned, although it's not a mixer, the GX4816 also has two DX ports where I can connect uh, up to 32 channels of audio um, per port on the front panel as well. Okay, so 
the all mysterious, uh, all magical, self-sufficient uh, S-Link port. And I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on this because um, there's sometimes a little bit of confusion or misunderstanding around uh, the way uh, the S-Link port works. And it's very important to understand that S-Link is not a protocol. It's not a, a, a network language that allows us to send audio in the same way that we've talked about ACE, we've talked about GigaRace, DX and DSnake. Those are all audio network protocols. S-Link is not. S-Link is an auto switching port, which will automatically switch itself to whatever protocol uh, is the protocol of the box that you've connected to the port. So if I connect a DX16.8, uh, for example, to an S-Link port, the S-Link port will automatically detect that it's a DX port, uh, DX box that's been connected and it will switch the S-Link port to DX mode. So that port essentially becomes a DX port with all of the parameters and features that we've just uh, mentioned in terms of latency, number of channels, etc. If I were to connect a GX4816 to an S-Link port, that port, that S-Link port would essentially become um, a GX port, allowing you to tra transmit 128 channels of audio. So the 48 inputs of the GX, uh, 4816, as well as the two DX ports on the front panel. Um, again, S-Link is designed to be point to point, so no network switching. Um, and it follows all of the parameters of whatever protocol it has switched itself to be. So all of the things we've looked at before in terms of uh, um, GigaRace performance, DX performance, etc., uh, will become what's on that port. So hopefully that clears it up and it makes it quite clear. Um, the way it does that, just so you know, is essentially when you connect a box to that, it's going to look at the connection speed. So if it knows it's um, a one, if it sees that whatever's connected is running at one gigabit per second, it knows straight away that's going to be a gigarace or a, a GX box. Uh, if it sees that it's a 100 megabit per second connection, it's going to go, oh, 100 megabit per second. That could be an AR or a BD snake box or that could be a DX box. And then it's gonna look at sample rate. And if it sees the sample rate is 96K, then it knows it's a DX box. If it sees it's 48 kilohertz, then it knows it's gonna be a DSnake box. So very easily it detects what's at the end and it switches itself automatically, including to the ME protocol, the ME personal monitoring system. Now we're not gonna to touch on that too much today because we've got some ME uh, webinars coming up in just a couple of weeks that I'll uh, definitely invite uh, you to join if you possibly can. Um, but yeah, that S-Link port can also communicate to uh, ME units or an ME hub. Um, and whether that's the built-in S-Link that you find on the back of an SQ, for example, or an S-Link card slot, um, again, that will uh, communicate with ME if you want to. So where do we find ME? We find uh, ME, sorry, where do we find S-Link? We find S-Link on the back of SQ, and I think most SQ users are well aware of that by now. Uh, Avantis also has a built-in uh, S-Link port on the back. And also our matrix mixer AHM has an S-Link as well and can carry the same option cards as SQ. So you can uh, put a second S-Link card into an AHM as well. Cool, so that's the, the tough bit around the protocols and the different connectors and stuff like that. I wanted to touch really briefly on automatic firmware matching. And for me, as, a, as an engineer, and I've done lots of different things with lots of different stage boxes and digital network protocols, the automatic firmware matching side of things is an absolute godsend when it comes to making your life easier on the day-to-day. -day. It's happened to me, not loads of times, but it's happened to me and to many people I know on a regular basis where you rent a digital stage box in, not from Alan Heath, uh, with, with other manufacturers, and when you connect that stage box to your mixing console, they don't match firmware. So what do you have to do? You then need to figure out what's the firmware of your mixing console. Okay, I need to upgrade the firmware of my stage rack so that they can talk to each other. So then if you're in the field or the middle of nowhere, you need to get an internet connection so you can download that firmware from the website. So you download the firmware. Then you need to figure out the... Um, firmware update procedure, which can sometimes be a bit of a pain in the neck. So you do the firmware upgrade and then your consoles and your stage rack talk to each other. So you're happy, 
And then you finish your gig and you send that stage rack that you've rented for another rental company back. And two weeks later, you get an angry phone call from them because their stage rack doesn't talk to their mixer anymore because you've changed the firmware on it. So they then have to go through the same procedure again anyway. So those headaches, I've been there and, and it really does become a bit of a pain uh, in the neck when, when that sort of thing happens to you. Well, with all of our proprietary protocols, whether that's DSnake, DX, GX, uh, and the likes, as soon as I connect an expander, it's going to look after that for you and you don't have to worry about that. And it's going to do that in both directions. Whether I need to upgrade or downgrade the firmware of my expanders, maybe I've got a brand new firmware, uh, sorry, a brand new uh, expander straight off the shelf, which has got the latest firmware in it. And I'm connecting it to a much older Allen Heath mixer that's got an old version of firmware. I still don't have to worry about that. It's going to downgrade the firmware of the expander or the stage box so that it can still talk to the mixing console. So very simple. There's nothing to do as a, as a user. All you need to do is you connect your stage box to the mixing console. It says mainframe will say mixing console. Once that data link is established, the two will handshake. They'll talk to each other and they'll go, this firmware doesn't match. We can't communicate to each other properly. So within a matter of three, four, less than five seconds, basically by the time you plug it in, stand up, move back in front of the mixing console, the firmware will be dumped from the mixing console to the stage box and it will update it and they'll be good to go uh, and ready to use. So keep up to date with your firmware on your mixing console is the first thing I can re recommend as much as possible. Um, and then you don't have to worry about your stage boxes working properly with, with your mixing console at all. Plug it in and it works. And even if you rent stage boxes from someone else and you upgrade them to the latest firmware, if they plug them back into their older firmware, it'll still work as well. And, and it's really straightforward. Cool, so that's the automatic firmware matching. And again, it's one of those things that you never have to think about because it does it by itself and it's a great feature. But when you don't have that and you get back into those situations, you really realize how valuable this is and how beneficial it is. So a really quick recap before I uh, grab some of your questions and I see some questions have come in. Thank you very much for those. Um, a quick recap. So iLive and GLD uh, were the consoles that carried ACE GLD with an ACE card and GLD also used the DSnake protocol. Q uses exclusively the DSnake protocol. So if you're on a QU, you can use the AR and AB stage boxes. Uh, SQ, because of the S-Link and the auto switching port, it can connect to DSnake boxes. So 48 kilohertz AR boxes, Giga Ace or GX boxes and DX boxes as well. Now, just one precision on this and I want to make it really clear. You cannot mix those protocols together. So you can't have an AB16.8 and a DX16.8 daisy chained together. One is at 96 kilohertz, the other is at 48 kilohertz. So, um, so that won't work. You have to stay either at 96 or at 48 kilohertz uh, within your, your daisy chain stage boxes, okay? So SQ can take either the DSnake boxes, which are A or AB, or GX or DX boxes. DLive can take um, Giga Ace or DX. Avantis, again, it has the S-Link port, so it can talk to DSnake, Giga Ace, GX or DX boxes. And AHM also has the S-Link as well. A quick um, recap of those protocols. So we, we mentioned the Ace and DSnake are both, both 100 megabit per second uh, protocols. They both run at 48 kilohertz. Uh, channel count of ACE is up to 64 and DSnake we saw is uh, 40 plus 20. ACE allows tunneling of ethernet data so I can uh, carry third party data, remote control data through ACE if I want to. ACE also allows redundancy with the primary and the secondary cable if I want to. And the DSnake also has auto firmware matching so it'll update any stage boxes as I've just mentioned. Ultra low latency, and we uh, recommend cable lengths up to 100 meters max. Moving on to our 96 kilohertz protocols, which are Giga Ace, GX, and DX. Um, Giga Ace, as the name says, runs at one gigabit. DX runs at 100 uh, meg. Both 96 kilohertz sample rates. 
GigaRace is up to 128 channels, DX is up to 32. With GigaRace, we can tunnel um, Ethernet data. Uh, they both allow redundancy as well, so we can have primary and secondary cables for, for backup. Uh, if I'm connecting a DX box or actually a GX box, this is slightly inaccurate. I should have a third column here for GX. Uh, it will automatically update my firmware and they both run at ultra low latency at five and eight samples. And we recommend up to hundred meter cables. Cool. So hopefully that's been a, a, an insightful overview for you. Um, I will keep my PowerPoint open for a minute because I have a feeling I might want to uh, jump back to some of uh, those slides really quickly to answer some of your questions. So, um, any future updates coming for Q? I cannot answer that question. Uh, that's a question for Keith uh, as the product specialist for Q. So if you want, I recommend you jump onto his Facebook Live, which will be uh, on Thursday, the day after tomorrow at 3 p.m. He'll be on Facebook Live and I'm sure he'll happily answer any of your questions um, and I see Johnny had a second question about connecting Q consoles together uh, again one for Keith um, if you grab him on Facebook on Thursday I'm sure he'll happily answer those uh, for you uh, George Espinosa you asked whether you can connect two AR2412 boxes together so let me just jump back to my um, slide which is here oh not that one that one so as we saw, uh, DSNake, the protocol that is used with AR and AB stage boxes, is 40 input channels and 20 output channels. Now, because AR2412 is 24 inputs, if I daisy chain two together, that would be 48 inputs and it would be 24 outputs. And as we can see here, the DSNake maximum channel count is 40 by 20. So we go over that. 2412 uh, is only daisy chainable uh, as here with AB16 or AR8 for uh, stage boxes. So hopefully answers that question. Um, let me have a quick look. I need to read your questions as well. Um, can GigaRace travel through a switch between surface and mix rack? Uh, David, that's a very good question. It's a question we do get quite often. So. Yes, you can, uh, and there's a good knowledge base article on this if you want to go in a little bit more detail. However, it has to be done through a VLAN, and there can only be um, uh, the GigaRace uh, or the Allen Heath protocol within that VLAN. Also, um, GigaRace is not compatible. Any of our protocols are not compatible with trunking. So if you want to send multiple uh, VLANs through a trunk, it's not something we support either for, for various reasons, um, but you can use GigaRace into uh, a switch and there's a knowledge base article on, on how to uh, parameter that switch, um, but it should basically be a dumb switch with no advanced functionality on it. Um, and you can use that if you wanted to convert, for example, um, your GigaRace to a fiber and send that fiber over a distance longer than hundred meters, you can do that as well provided it's in a VLAN and there is only the GigaRace data in that VLAN, not any other um, uh, data as well. Pete, you have a very good question as well. Does DT168 only operate with a Dante card or can it work with S-Link 2? Now, I purposely decided not to. I should have actually shown our DT168 uh, and DT64W Dante stage boxes as well. Um, because today the subject was the Allen Heath proprietary protocols, uh, I, I decided not to. I really hesitated for a minute. We do have a DT168 and a DT164W Dante stage box available um, uh, for use with Dante. Now, those boxes, as your question asks, do need to be connected to a Dante card. S-Link uh, will not switch to Dante protocol. It doesn't integrate Dante at all within its protocols. So our Dante boxes or any other Dante devices for that matter must be connected to, uh, to uh, a Dante card as well. Um, let me just read through your questions. Uh, 
Jersey, Dante card is the only possibility to connect uh, ME to DN. So I'm guessing you want to connect the ME personal monitoring system to a DLive uh, mix rack. The answer to that is no. So the DLive mix rack, and let me see if I can, if it's actually on my little picture here, um, has a dedicated ME port on the front. So if you want to connect ME to a DLive system, there is a dedicated 48 kilohertz port just for the ME system itself. Now you can connect this uh, ME port to an ME hub, which is our uh, switch for distributing ME systems if you want to, um, or you can connect it to one and daisy chain all your uh, ME uh, units as well. Um, let me have a quick look through your questions. There's lots of questions. I'm really happy about this. Um, so if I wanted to run sound and record an orchestra using 48 channels with a backup recording option, what do you recommend at 96 kilohertz along with personal monitoring systems? That depends what mixing system you're using. I'm going to take a guess. And if you're saying 48 channels, I'm going to say it's SQ um or Avantis. So with SQ you do have the option of uh doing USB recordings, but that would be at 96 kilohertz, but you're not going to meet the 48 channels. Um, if you want to do that, then uh it would need to be with a Dante card uh inside your SQ optional card slot. Now you also want to do personal monitoring as well. Normally, you'd have your inputs connected to your onboard S-Link of your... Oh, let me, hang on, let me ring up this picture to make it a little bit clearer. So this is the back of an SQ, and we've got the built-in S-Link port, and then we've got the card optional card slot as well. So you'd have all your inputs, your 48 channels of input, maybe a JX4816 connected to here. Um, and you also want to do 96 kilohertz recording. Well, the GX4816 is a great solution for this because, um, and I'll come back to my GX4816 picture, which is here. You could have your 48 inputs connected to your GX4816 with the GX port that would connect to your um, S-Link port of your SQ. You could have a Dante card uh, in your optional card slot to do your 96 kilohertz recording. And the GX4816, the second port on the GX4816, actually auto switches to ME mode if you uh, connect a ME or an ME system to it. So you could do your 48 inputs for your orchestra. You could do your 96 kilohertz recording with the Dante card uh, in the back of an SQ uh, and do your ME personal monitoring uh, through the ME port on there. So hopefully that answers your question. Sorry, I had to really think about it and make sure I was getting that uh, correct. Um, does any protocol allow more than a two-way split, i.e. three or four-way splits? Um, from William, I'm, I think what you're asking me is whether you can send it to multiple devices at the same time. No, you need individual cards. So if you're in a DLive system, for example, you'd need to have two cards or three cards if you wanted to split three or four ways. The other option for that is to go to Dante and then with Dante, you could come out of one Dante card and split to multiple uh, other mixers as long as those also had Dante cards on board as well. Okay, uh, but very good question. Um, uh, did you mention that Q's D snake can connect to S link? Uh, yes, it can. So what that means is that I can connect any of the S link mixers. So whether that's um, SQ or Avantis to the D snake port on the back of a Q. That means I could use my inputs from an SQ, for example, share them to my S link port, which would auto switch to D snake and send those inputs to a Q mixer, for example, to mix front of house and monitor. So I could do that if I wanted to. Hopefully that, that answers your question. Um, I have three iLive systems, Vladimir. Thank you very much for, for 
using I Ivan for looking ahead, I want to move into a Vantis system, which is an excellent idea, go for it. Uh, is the ML adapt the adequate and correct way to connect them via ACE? So I'm guessing you want to um, connect, to, to use Avantis basically, and to still use your iLife systems to mix monitors, for example. Uh, that is exactly correct. So the ML adapt, which is a, a card adapter that you can use with Avantis, with the ACE card would be exactly the right way to, to send um, that to your iLife system. Cool. Uh, Mark PA man, are all the preamps the same or is the DX uh, slightly better than AB other than sample rate? Well, actually um, the two kind of go together. So uh, yes, by definition, um, the preamps are better and they're going to perform in a better way than they are um, just due to the quality of the conversion because we call it uh, converting at 96 kilohertz rather than 48. Um, they're all very good preamps to be completely honest with you. And you can hear differences. One, whether one sounds better than the other is kind of a little bit subjective, but, um, but they're, you know, they, they are an evolution. They're a more modern preamp. So obviously I'm sure you can appreciate that, um, that there's an evolution on the performance. Uh, Alexander, uh, will there be an SQ rack version? can't tell you that if I did I would be um, looking for a new job um, like all of the other amazing future products that we have in the pipeline and not that the SQ rat is one of those um, but um, yes I'm, I'm um, not going to share any information about products that might or might not see the future um, but thanks very much for your feedback and thanks for using SQ5 for several German bands um, but I'll definitely take that on board and make sure it reaches the correct um, uh, ears. Um, I'm going to take one more question and then I'm going to call it a day because uh, I've got lots and lots of really good questions today. And thanks very much uh, for all of those. Uh, what is the preamp used in SQQ of Antis D Live series consoles? Well, they're uh, uh, designed by us. So um, that is proprietary information. Again, um, it's a really, they are very, very good preamps. Um, they are Allen and Heath preamps. So, um, so slightly different de designs between the, um, between the different versions that you've mentioned, um, but they're all Allen and Heath preamp designs. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, Nick, adding to the three-way split, we have SQ and DLive with Avantis coming this way. Excellent news. Um, a thought was to have DLive front of house, Avantis on monitors, and SQ for broadcast miss. We have Dante cards. Did I get your answer correct that Dante would be the only way? Uh, it's not the only way, but it's probably the most straightforward considering you already have Dante cards. It will do the job. Um, and I don't see any reason why you should go another route really, because that'll do exactly what you want to do. Um, so DLive front of house with a Dante card, you can split to your SQ and to the Avantis at the same time. Um, all on single Dante network, that'll do, that'll do absolutely fine. Um, what will be the configuration for connecting an Avantis to GLD? I will get back to you on that. Um, Alex, you're awake again. Um, oh, actually, it might be a, an hour later for you this week because uh, you've changed time before we have. Thanks again for joining. Um, when the next update on Prime, will there be a session? Yes, we're gonna talk about Prime a little bit. Um, Jack might touch on it a little bit. Um, if not, we'll plan a Prime webinar for the future. Of course, um, if there are any topics you'd love us to cover, uh, please um, do drop them into the questions box and we'll, we'll take that into account. Um, I'm going to bring that to a close. I will do my very best to answer any of your other questions um, via email over the next couple of days as much as I possibly can. Um, oh, I'm going to answer Chris's question. Do these protocols work over fiber media converters? Yes, they do. Um, so there are some specifications over to which media converters work or do not work. If you need to transmit um, over more than 100 meters, then you can use more or less standard media converters to take it to fiber. Again, meeting the same um, prerequisites that there can only be that data, uh, only be our protocol data uh, on that media converter. So you can't, 
um, you cannot mix it with other data, whether that's lights, whether that's video or your IT network. Um, those should not be integrated and sent through uh, the same fiber network. Um, it, it will cause some issues. Um, so again, thank you very much for joining. Um, we're about to announce the next set of sessions. So have a look at Alan dash heath.com forward slash sessions um we we've got another couple of sessions on uh, our technology so the hardware the protocols and, and, and like we've done today um over the next couple of weeks and then we will be announcing over the next sort of 10 days the next block of sessions which will be much more related to uh control so remote control uh, midi custom layers all of that stuff much more related to controlling our systems will be over the next uh six weeks Keep an eye out for that on our website as well. Um, again, Facebook Live every Thursday with Jack and Keith. Um, and I join you more or less every other week on a Tuesday at the same time. So again, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you're all well. I can't wait to get out and meet you in person as soon as that's absolutely possible. Um, and have a great day. Thanks very much. <laughs>